go. Okay. Hopefully this is inspired and um, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the inspired Word of God, but we're going to talk about the Word of God today in three parts. Does anyone know what the three parts are? Um, this is the world according to Jack. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the Logos Word of God, the Rhema Word of God, and what's the last one? The Manifested Word of God. So we'll start with the Logos Word of God. And we could, uh, we could, you could open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy uh, 3, 17. Let's see. See if I can remember this one. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Something like that. I did that. Uh, that was a scripture that uh, Brad's father, Jack, gave me one time and told me that I needed to commit it to memory. So I'm like a word guy. Men, everybody in here probably knows this, but hopefully this is refreshing. But it's as if every scripture in here was God breathed. So this is the inspired word of God. It's actually, I mentioned this on, were you in church on Sunday, Shay? No, okay. So this this will be, there's a 20% overlap from, from what I was talking about Sunday. But I had, I was researching the, uh, and talked about this hundred year prophecy that Bob Jones gave. And it's interesting to me that in the 60s, there was a decade of the spirit that moved on the church and people got baptized by the Holy Spirit out of, straight out of denominations, like a rain cloud would show up in the sanctuary and just whack everybody. And the ones, you know, there were, 20% of it accepted it and moved on, and I don't know what the percentage was. But anyway, there was a big move. Then in the 70s, it was the word of God. It was the inspired, a revelation of the inspired word of God here. So um, so anyway, in, uh, if y'all are still turned there, I haven't gotten there yet. Second Timothy, all of the T's in the Bible are together. Did y'all know that? Who told me that? Huh? I did. I didn't tell you that I knew that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I like I like the way this thing can get corrupted. And it, it says, I used to quote these scriptures all the time and not even know what they meant. Like like in verse five, it talks about having a form of godliness, but denying its power or the nature and authority of God from such people turn away. And then it says, if, if, we, if we don't treat this as the inspired word of God and look to go deeper into the rhema word of God, well, verse seven will happen to us, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But um, I like verse 15 that preceded that too. That from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, this is Timothy writing, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. I'll say it again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, some translations say perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, um, so this logos in this book is, that's, that's the word word, 
it, many times in this Bible, it's uh, translated in the Greek as logos. That's the informational word of God. It's a love story from Papa to his friends, to his sons and his daughters. It's a picture of the bridegroom, Jesus, and his bride, us, the church. And uh, and everything in, you really need to get into the rhema to understand that everything in here points to Jesus, I think. So it's not meant to be read to gain knowledge or information, or, or we will be ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. So it's a history, uh, there's a history of the Bible in here. History stands for his story. Have y'all heard that before? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so if you read this with, this is what I've most recently been taught by our mentor. If you, you want to read this without trying to understand and let the Holy Spirit come upon you, uh, come alive and lead us into supernatural knowledge and understanding and the rhema word of God. And so we're going to the rhema word of God next. But first, look at Isaiah 9, 6. Does anybody know what that says? I don't, but I know that you're about to tell us. <laughs> This is cool. So this is a transition that I came up with to go from the Logos to the Rhema. So listen to this. This is the Christmas scripture that you hear this at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forever, even forward, from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So this is, so if I'm just, if I'm, if I'm not a born again person and I've chose to read this Bible here, I mean, that is something that would kind of jump out. How can that not jump out at anybody? But me reading it just like that is Logos. It's not really, though, because I can feel the Lord's presence right now. But to for Isaiah, for Isaiah to write this, um, I mean, that's powerful. That was the rhema word of God right there. So the rhema word of God is, the, is not the informational word of God like the Logos. It's the... Spiritual word of God. Okay, so we're moving forward. You're going to hear something that you haven't heard before, hopefully, maybe. So everybody knows all that, right? So so the rhema, so that's how I transitioned into the rhema. But what's interesting about me picking that scripture too is those are also, isn't this the school, what's this called? School, school of the, the Spirit, Spirit or the prophetic? School of the Spirit. This is a wonderful way some characteristics of the prophetic. Think about that. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, those are, anyway, I think that's, that's pretty cool. So basically, you know, so with part two of this, we finished part one, moving into part two. The rhema word of God, essentially, essentially what this boils down to is uh, the many different ways that God speaks to us. And I think it's good to start with Romans 10, 17, because anyone know what that says? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word, word of God, the word and word of God there is translated rhema. So you have to hear the voice to operate in faith. Faith comes by hearing in your heart. Right, Wesley? Yes, sir. And then I think of this, this next one. And here's the end point of this to me. Um, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the soul and spirit, dividing uh, a division of the 
joints and the marrow. What's the rest of it? Help me. Um, let's look at it. Um, that's Hebrews 4.12. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There, I got it. There you go. Okay, so that's, the, that's those, those scriptures really kind of illuminated me when I was spirit-filled. A lot of people say that William Branham walked in, that scripture is actually called, some people call that the word of God. Uh, the word of God is quick, and that's quick in the King James. It's alive. So the rhema word of God is alive. Um, William Branham, I've, I've heard Paul Keith Davis teach on this so much, that William Branham actually walked in the word of God. Like the king of glory, he would stand at the pulpit, wait in the meetings for the Lord, for the angel of the Lord to come stand next to him. Jesus is standing next to him and then he never got anything wrong. He called out everything that there was and they came up and every one of them got healed. So that was, uh, so, you know, he walked in this. Um, but this is actually another way to say this. If the Logos, the Logos is the letter, this is the spirit behind the letter, the rhema word of God. When we hear the rhema, hopefully every day, this is another cool thing about the rhema word of God. Every time we hear it, we're transformed little by little into his image and likeness so that one day you can be like Wesley. I, I'm sorry, so that uh, you can ultimately be perfected into his likeness. Could, could so. we not say that the logos in, in many ways becomes... Like if we looked at it from a place of where you have the spirit of God, also known as the sperma of God, and you have the seed of God, the lo like the logos, where you have a logos that is like the egg and the, and the seed or the spirit of God comes and fertilizes what's being there in the first place, thus producing fruit. I think that's an incredible analogy. Actually, yeah, yeah, that's good. I don't know if I've ever heard that either. So, so, um, so when I think of this, what are the many ways? I wrote this book two years ago, and I've got all the profound ways that that the Lord. Some of the profound ways I'll mention, but so this rhema word of God, the most common for us is probably dreams. I mean, I think uh, visions, visions and night visions. Um, I, I actually, uh, visions and night visions, um, open visions. I've had uh, four, four night visions when I first got spirit filled and I've never had one since. So they're wide awake when they're happening and they were just profound. And uh, I mean, electrifying. Every cell in my body was like electricity running through my body. One of, one of them was a, was a place in, uh, I saw this place in Venezuela where I just knew in the night vision it was Venezuela and all these boards were flying through there, these white boards, and they lined up and formed a fence. And in the inside of the fence was a statue of Jesus. And, a, and there was a mango orchard outside of the fence. And so um, that wound up coming to pass. Me and Mickey Chance and a guy named Mike Conkle, four months later, find ourselves in that jungle down there and, and find the statue of Jesus and... That's making my hair stand up. So that, that was a night vision, but it was really bizarre because uh, if I would open my eyes, it would stop, and then it would pick right up again uh, when I closed my eyes. And, and uh, then two, I had two night visions of scriptures, and what was profound about those um, is the last song that we were singing Abba, I belong to you. He made me feel like um, 
you know, he belongs to me and I belong to him. So I'm going to go into a scripture and show you that. But I got uh, two scriptures. One of them was um, about him giving me faith, um, Ephesians 2.8. And the other one was, was the Great Commission according to Mark. But when I saw it in my, it was just words, just the words, like a ticker tape. And they went across, not the way we read a book, it went the opposite way from right to left, like the way the way Hebrews. So that was profound. So with that, uh, I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna be mixing this up a little bit. But look at turn turn to Numbers twelve six because this this tells me I'm gonna I might jump back and forth a little bit. But I was gonna say what is the purpose of the manifested word of God? This is to me, I haven't heard this from anybody, but the purpose of, the, of part three that we're getting into, the manifested word of God, I believe is to, is to make himself known to us. Mm-hmm. And, then it, and then to me, it evolves into relationship and friendship. So if you look at Numbers 12, six, actually this is scriptural. So hear my words, is there a prophet, is there a prophet among you? I the Lord, I the Lord make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is a faith, he is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. He see and he sees the form of the Lord. He sees Jesus. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So he says here that he makes himself known to the prophets in a vision. This is exactly what happened right here. This was, this was the fourth vision that I had. And that was the 40th day of my encounter. And uh, it was so bright that it was burning my eyelids and I wanted to open up my eyes. But if I open up my eyes, it stopped and I didn't have these wonderful feeling, electrifying feelings of love. So I just kept my eyes shut and just, it, I saw this swirling around for about uh, five minutes probably. And that was the Lord making himself known to me. But he, but he's, but he says, as for my servant, Moses, um, not so, because the manifested word of God came to Moses. So, uh, so with the, you okay, Stacy? So, so back to the many different ways the Lord speaks to us: dreams, visions, night visions. If y'all think of something really crazy, I'd, I'd love to hear it. An open vision. One time I was driving my car down the road, and. Uh, I forget what vehicle I was in and I went by this place where where Lacey's dad lives. There's a brick wall going down there. And I saw this clear as day. I saw this tank uh, fire and blow the wall apart. And so I I thought this was really profound. I thought the Lord was showing me that we're about to have a world war, some kind of big encounter in the war in the Middle East and all that. And... I think this is one thing to do with the rhema word of God as it applies to dreams and visions and and other sayings is that we want to per, try to personalize it first because all he was trying to do was tell me that he was breaking down the hard, very hard walls of my heart. That's what that tank was doing. So, uh, hadn't really worked yet, has it? <laughs> no, so uh, no, it's working. So then I think of other other things are our senses, sight, smell, touch, taste, and then hearing with your with the eyes of your heart. Um, I think of um, angelic. You know, God sends angels to speak to us. I've had uh, one time, one time I had a guy that, that's in here too. I had a guy, I wanted to go pray for a guy that had crippling arthritis. 
And this guy goes, dude, I don't feel good about that. You need to try to get a sign. And I've learned that's very immature. I don't ask the Lord for signs anymore. But he sent one to me. So I hear, I hear singing like Josh Groban. And you could hear it from two miles away. And, and it was, he was singing in his angelic tongue as he approached me on the street. And that was, and I tried to talk to him and he just looked at me out of the corner of his eye. Looked like a homeless man. And he rounded the corner and kept on singing. I went to work, called my friend Mike back, and I said, hey, we're supposed to go pray for that guy. And we went and prayed for that guy. And so here, I'm going to use another way that God speaks to man. There were two, two in this encounter, several ways in this encounter. So we decided, he lives way out in the woods. I'm going to invite him to come to church here soon. He told me he would come. He is an extraordinary guy. He's been in like 40 movies because he's eccentric looking. But the Lord, he, he was literally bent over like that. And the Lord healed him. And while we were praying, there were deer running a circle around us in the woods, like seven or eight deer on dry leaves. And I had only been baptized in the spirit three days. So that's why this 40-day encounter was so profound. And I believe God. I think that, you know, this is another way that God speaks to me. Just this, this whole book right here, you could say. It's, it's about an awakening in me it's about waking up and that that's the, another reason for the manifested word of god to wake wake us up so my friends were praying in the spirit the whole time and i hadn't spoken in tongues yet the first miracle i saw was a a healing of a man in a coma so uh i could hear them though i could hear johnny this guy johnny cry out heal the pain and uh, they were speaking in tongues. And I, while driving back 45 minutes later, I actually realized I had interpreted tongues before I ever spoke in tongues. I heard heal the pain. And I was looking at him. I opened up my eyes and looked at him. And his, the utterances weren't even lining up with what I was hearing. But it was his voice I was hearing. So that, that's pretty crazy. So that's another way that of the rhema or the way that God speaks to us is through... Um, Interpretation of tongues, impressions, or you just know that you know. You know, I have face to face from the manifested word. That's uh, trances. I wrote in here that I have, I, in 2019, I wrote in here that I had never had a trance, but Peter had a trance where the Lord told him to kill and eat, but I've I since had a trance. And it, it's. Um, got in like a sleep like state and saw some things so that were that at the time that that happened a year ago I didn't even believe hardly what I was seeing that it couldn't possibly be for me that I got it wrong and I've only really believed some of these things that I'm going to share tonight deeply in the last month and, and I can, and I'll explain why. So then you have spiritual gifts, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, the gift of prophecy for edification, exhortation, and comfort, you know, discernment of spirits, the gift of understanding. God, God has, he's spoken to me before through an ina inanimate object. Stacy and I were watching TV when our daughter Sarah's horn went off in the garage we had lunch with her today and so i walked out there turned it off went back in turn on the tv and five minutes later the horn goes off again and that happened three times and and the lord was sounding the alarm that she was ready for his service and that pardon me i was supposed to get out of her way and i actually reminded her of that today too then I mentioned God speaking through the animal kingdom. I mean, I've had some profound experiences through the being in harmony with the animal kingdom. I think they're farther along, you know, than we are. And then uh, <laughs> one time, then here's, here's like watching a movie on TV. This is the rhema word of God. I was watching Burn Notice. And they were about to engage the enemy and they were heavily outnumbered. And the, ba the battle was going to begin the next day and the actor said, tomorrow is going to be a long day. 
And I mean, I got whacked when I heard that. And like the next season of my life were some business mistakes that I made that were profoundly uh, difficult. Numerology, the Lord speaks to me. Lot, many times if, when I get a hotel room number, there's a scripture that goes with the number. I mean, I get crazy stuff with numbers. The Lord likes to speak to me through numerology. Um, Stacy and I found 386 coins on the side of the road one time riding a bicycle. And paper money, foreign coins, silver coins, we had to fill up our pockets, drive back and get the Suburban and and because uh, empty out our pockets and pick up more is like a treasure hunt. And the Lord really gave us a profound message in that. Here's another way. Through a, through a parabolic natural occurrence. Okay, in 1998, that was two years before I was born again, I won a race up a mountain called Rich Mountain. And I, I beat two people on the, um, I beat two people on the U.S. national team. That's when I found out I was really getting pretty good with cycling. And they lived and trained in Colorado on the government's expense. And I won the race by five seconds, and it was 2,000 feet of climbing. So there, and, and I did the race in 41 minutes and 41 seconds. And this is cool. My friend Mickey and I were driving up there years later after I was born spirit-filled to stay at the Queen Wilhelmina Lodge to pray if the Lord would give us anything for the new year. And I had a, I did have a, an open vision up there that night while we were doing that. But when I was riding up Rich Mountain, he goes, and I told him my time, he goes, dude, that's a scripture. It was easy to get the scripture because there's only one forty-one forty-one in the whole Bible. And it's Genesis. And it says, see now, Joseph, now Joseph, I have put you in the land of Egypt. And it was a calling to go to the top of the mountain of economy or the mountain of riches. And there was great grace upon me because I beat two national team guys by five seconds. 2,000 feet of climbing, 2,000 years after the Lord. Anyway, and I wasn't even born again when that happened. That was two years before. Man, he's always turned on and speaking. Or he, 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 Papa knew that I would get that ultimately, I think. Don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. That, you, and you got it. Yeah. So. You showed me he's going before you. Pardon? I feel like that showed you that he's going before you. Yeah, no, that, that's really good, too. Two years before, you yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's downshift hmm. for a second. And how does this apply to everyday life? Because you've shared some straight up biblical examples and some radical, you can find them in scripture examples. But how does this come into everyday life? Like how does this get applied to loving your wife raising your kids or working or just living amongst people or is that part four or three or whatever number we're on? Am I jumping ahead? No. No, I think applications. I mean, uh, everything in the Christian faith is founded upon, uh, Paul said one word, that the gospel is Christ. So our lives, I, I actually... I actually felt like I heard this from the Lord. Okay, if you want to live a, a high standard of living in tough inflationary times, you have to follow the standard. Okay, and we must be like little children um, and radically obedient. I think that um, there's nothing better than hearing the voice of God. And, and so I'm just illustrating all the many different ways there in part two, part three is just one way really. So part two is, um, and that's part of, part of loving God. You can call that a relationship or a love affair. What, was that a Rick Pino song? What were the lyrics of that second song? That, yeah, that was Rick, Pour My Love On You. Yeah, I mean, he's, that's a man singing that to to Jesus. Yeah. That sounded romantic. 
That's, you know, that might sound kind of corny, but I think that if we can love him first, we can love others and love all of those around us. And that's what it does for our average daily life. But another answer to your question, Wesley, is like Stacy's had many dreams that are directional that like, like one time we were selling a house and had to reduce the price of the house by $5,000. Our house had been on the market for like four months. She has a dream to reduce the price by $5,000 and we sell the house in two days. Okay. So, I mean, so the Lord, I think that if, if we can, you know, he gave us, he gave us two commandments, right? The Lord gave us two commandments. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and all your soul and all your might and all your strength. And then in the end, he said, I give you a new commandment and it's to love your brothers. So I think that our walk with God, if we turn to our first love, which the church has lost, if we look to God first in all things and the many creative ways that we might be missing that he speaks to us, um, if you've had an encounter with the Lord, it's going to be it's going to be hard for me to walk into the office and be a jerk. Okay, at least for an hour or two. <laughs> no, <laughs> for 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 that day. Oh, okay. So, no, I, I don't know what you're really asking me. So the, Yeah. How, how has that impacted in the way that you live and the way that you do things? Like, it, it's taking it apart and really dissecting it and going, all right. So I think that, I think I've shared a lot of that if you read between the lines and the testimonies that I've just given. Like, even, even just knowing that he called me to be in the career field that I'm in. And even like the sale of our business that I got through a, a profound dream, listen to this one, where I'm at an affluent guy's house and I'm fishing and this porpoise is jumping out of the water and I'm going like this. And the interpretation of the dream is, is that we're about to come into provision so that I can embrace my porpoise in life. So that's about as helpful and directional as you can get or even... I think um, I think that you know my relationship with Stacy really kind of in a lot of ways points to what the the bride has with the bridegroom. So what we have in the natural kind of points to the spiritual, and and we get directional things in our relationship by hearing the voice of the Lord, you know, as well. So. Y'all have any questions or does anyone else have something profound, a profound way that, um, that Shay? No.
Yeah, this is, um, I, I think, here, here's a profound way to look at it. Okay, so Wesley, of course Wesley stepped out. He can't hear me out there, can he? I hope he's doing okay. Okay, I'm on to part three, the manifested word of God. You know, I, I was reading in Genesis yesterday morning, and verse two, Two nineteen. Two nineteen. Um, in two nineteen it says, Out of the ground the Lord God for God formed every field and every bird of the air, and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, and whatever Adam called each living living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So, so they're getting ready to have family for the first time after that. But that, that makes me, when I, think about, when I think about the things, what do we have in this life? Or I was talking about standard of living or... You know, I I want I don't want to stand before the Lord and him tell me that or he's not going to say anything. I'm just going to I think every man and woman stands before the Lord when they die naked and they don't have to say anything because just the glory of the Lord is so strong. They know everything and your whole flash life's life flashes before you and, and he asks, you know, the two questions. What have you done? Did you learn to love? And what have you done with the life which I gave you? And I, I would like to know that whatever he's had for me, that, uh, that I have attained that. So this whole thing is the manifested word of God started for me with Papa waking me up. And actually this was the 40th night of my encounter and he told me this is the end for now. It was a new beginning for me, but that was the end of the, the crazy stuff. And then, and then it turns into a friendship, friendship with God and relationship. And um, I thought I'd go back and share this. This is too profound. I just realized I had one more experience. I was at a conference at Christian Center with Stacy. And, and Chuck Pierce was speaking and all of a sudden my elbow started burning like it was on fire. And while I was sitting there, it bubbled up about a half of an inch and like a blister. And so three days later, there's a scab form there. And about two weeks later, I scraped the scab off. And for five years, I had a tattoo of a fish on my elbow that God tattooed me during the meeting. Now that's pretty profound, isn't it? And he, and he told me, sealed for service. And I thought, I mean, that, that you have to feel so profoundly loved. And, and there's times in our lives, I'm sure all of us don't always feel that way. We might, some people start off their days that way, you know. So getting back to the manifested word of God, I said that the purpose of it, this is me. We read that in the scriptures and numbers. It's to make make himself known to us. And then I think, I think it can evolve into a love affair like Rick Pino, is that who it was? Yes, singing with all of his heart. I mean, it sounds like he's singing to a woman, but he's singing you know, to his Lord and his God. And, and I think there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that point to this. I think of, these just came off the top of my head. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Psalms 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 12 or 13 says, and he became uh, flesh and dwelt among us. And then, and then if you look at 1 John 1, 1 through 3, uh, 1 John 1, 1 through 3. 
That which was from the beginning, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If you want to know the future, you need to know the end or the future. Because he that's Jesus. You could substitute his name in there. And he tells his friends these things. That's not the focus. The focus is just know him. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Man, I want that. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, you could substitute Jesus in there, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that to me means whatever John had, it's available to us. And he wrote this book so that our joy may be full because he may have had a revelation of Jesus better than any of the writers, I don't know. But he, he did get to write in Revelation 2.1, it says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, excuse me, I did it, Wesley, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, which are the seven churches. He's doing, that's in the present tense, walks. So he's walking in the midst of the church, looking for someone hungry that wants to visit with him. And I could go back to Exodus, Exodus 33, which is very much like Numbers 12. This is the manifested word of God. I'll show you a few of these. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp. This is verse 7. And called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass, this is really pathetic to me, came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses. I mean, why couldn't they do that? Until he had gone into the tabernacle and it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshiped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Moses and Abraham, it says in James 2.23, Jesus said, Abraham saw my, he rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. So, and he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Anyway, he speaks to his friend. Abraham and Moses were friends with Jesus. That's in the old covenant. And so Moses was the only one, which is sad. And even in, in Numbers in Numbers 11, you know, he said, Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And I think um, Moses was sick and tired of Israel and he wanted everyone to hear God's voice. That's actually a mandate of Morningstar, North Carolina. I mean, I've heard Rick Joyner say that that's a, that's a mandate for them, that scripture, that they raise up a company of thinking prophets so so I was thinking I was thinking in thinking about the manifested word of God and him making himself known to you and seeing Jesus face to face it to me what does it mean to make himself known to you I mean to me look at when when the, the church could have the birth of the church could have been in Exodus 20 when Moses went up onto the mountain and he came down the mountain with all that awe and power and smoke and fire, and he comes down the mountain, and what have the Israelites done? They've made a golden image of God in the form of a cow, okay? I mean, they didn't know, um, 
They didn't know what God looked like. Um, if you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father, he said to Philip. But I think of that. I mean, I, I dream and yearn for manifestations of walking and talking with the Lord Jesus. And when I pray, I, all the, oftentimes these images flash before me of having seen him. You know, and think about a community like that that makes a golden calf. I mean, who do you pray to? It, the purpose is to make himself known to us and then move deeper and deeper into the relationship. And, a, and another one, y'all have probably heard this many times, John 14, 21 says, and this goes into, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest or reveal myself to him. Okay, so that's a wonderful, another place of this wonderful promise that he wants to, to visit us. And um, Stacy and I got a word at Morningstar probably 10 years ago that we were part of a band of, an emerging band of brothers in Shreveport. And I got a new meaning of that. We were walking the dogs last week and the Lord told me to share this Sunday in church because I went through this evolution with the hand of Rick Joyner's progression of the believer. And a lot of this, you can see that there, there is a progression because Jesus is saying, you know, I no longer call you a servant. I now call you friend. You're no longer my disciple. You're my friend. And so it's born again, believer, disciple, bond servant, friend of God, and fully manifested, you know, weos son. And I, I did this talk Sunday on friends and family. And I think in the world system, there's a big difference between friends and family, but in the kingdom of God, uh, there's a lot of similarities because it's not your biological family. Friends and family kind of blur, you know, together and, uh, but, but I got, the Lord told me to share this scripture. It's in the last chapter of the Bible. And it says, now I, John, this is chapter 22, verse eight. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets and of those who keep, keep the words of this book, worship God. That's the angel is actually Jesus in his humility, calling John a fellow prophet and brother. And I got this revelation this past week that one of the highest forms of friendship is, is, a, is a brotherhood. It's a brother. And, it, and that if, if I, the, the first time I ever got a word from the Lord, it was from Mickey when I first got spirit filled. Then we went to a prophetic conference at Christian Center and Ryan Woolley's ex-wife gave me a word that, that, uh, that I was a friend of God. And I mean, I got whacked when she told me that. But I, I really, I really didn't believe that in my heart. I couldn't possibly see myself, you know, as I'm not someone like Abraham or Moses. But, but, but if I can be a friend of God, we're all called to be friends of God. And there's no progression to get there, you know. It's just the realization or the awakening of the spirit to, I mean, Mary Magdalene got it in one single encounter. So um, 
I've really, just in the last week, had this enormous revelation that I'm, his, I'm, I'm actually his friend and his brother. And I actually, um, and there's going to be much deeper things coming for me. And, and I'm not saying that to boast or brag because I, I desire that for everybody in this fellowship or, you know, everyone. Okay, so John 16, 25, this is what I'm going for and this is what I want. These, this is red letters. These things. So after John 15 where he told them, you're no longer a disciple or a servant, you're my friend. He says, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And that's what I desire. There's many scriptures in there. My point with that scripture is that he spoke to the multitudes in parables. And then he did speak to them plainly, like the parable of the, the soil sample. He said, what did that parable mean? And he just went through plainly and told them uh, all of the symbology in the parable. You know, and I think he basically told them, y'all remember that? It's in there. So, um, so the way we have friendship with God and true sonship is to be part of his family. And who did he say that his family was? Who is your mother and your brother? It's the ones that are radically obedient to what he does. Remember when they said they're waiting outside for him? He said, my mother and my brother are the ones that do the will of my father in heaven. And that's how we, that's how we move on with this friendship with God. And I think for, for me... I mean, I just love the idea of the highest form of this to me is, 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 um, is just the relationship. But there's nothing like, you know, seeing him face to face. Um, oh, and I thought I'll share one or two other quick things. So what happens if we're not obedient to the word of the Lord? And what happens in the prophetic if we're not obedient or we do the opposite of what God tells us to do? I was thinking about this yesterday. Look at Numbers 22. I'll show you one thing. Remember when Balak wanted Balaam to curse Israel? Okay, y'all can look at this story, but I think this is profound. In Numbers twenty two twelve, it says, And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. And then in verse 20, in verse 20, after Balak tells him and tries to trick him, he comes back to him and says that he... He still wants him to go curse Israel. And it says in, in verse 20, God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. That, that's not what God said. That was twisted. So the second time he asks him, he hears a twisted word. And the way that you know that is, and it's, there he went the wrong way. So Balaam rose up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. We know what happened after that. But in the next verse, it says, then God's anger was aroused because he went. So that wasn't the Lord speaking to him the second time. He got messed up. But um, So what you're saying in that is even in the, we can hear the, we can hear the Lord clearly, repetitively. And then there is a moment at times where we're just going to hear some wishful thinking. Yeah. And, and, and call it the Lord. And I think, the, but the beautiful part about that is he draws us back in. 
I think that uh, I think that all of us go through seasons where we miss God really badly. And the higher that we go in the Lord, the enemy notches up and and tries to trick us even more. And I think I think that's why we need to be discipled and have a strong spiritual father in our lives and our church family. Right. And and that's the thing. He will determine who our friends and family are if we let him. I think everybody in this room is right where they're supposed to be. But, okay, y'all have heard that. So I'll share this with Shay in closing because this has inspired me so greatly. They've already heard this, but I was listening to God's stories and Brad was talking about a visitation. And I was like, man. And and this is, this is what, he, he actually walked and talked with the Lord, you know, walking on the beach or in his room. And it was the way... He is and was, you know. And I've, I've seen them in a number of different forms. And, and that's really, you know, what I desire. I would love, I mean, to have a day with the king where I could speak plainly with him, you know, face to face. That's one of the greatest desires that I have. Mm -hmm. And... But anyway, th so this was close. So I listened to this. I'm, I'm closing. And I thought, Lord, I want to, I haven't seen you in a while. I really want to see you. And I didn't think of anything. I started, I turn on, I get in my truck to drive to work, turn on this Kevin Prosh song that's about 15 minutes long. I don't think you like it. And how's it go? Pray. It's 38 minutes long. Okay, it's, it's, just this praise the Lord, oh my soul, and, and they're just jamming. And Leonard, Leonard is on the violin and everything. And I was, I was just so happy. And Bill and I park on this hill. And so I drive up. There's no cars anywhere around me. There's nothing. I park, turn my truck off, open up my door, and there's a man on a bicycle. And he's dismounting from the bicycle. And I think of Habakkuk 2.2 2 that says to write the vision down or write. I, when I wrote this down, I got, you, you still get revelation from stuff like this 10 years later. And so, um, so I realized I didn't know. I just thought it was some guy riding a bicycle. And then, but the, the bike was, was, I used to ride, race bicycles all the time. So this is really cool. And it had a green top tube. It was a cosmic looking colorful bike. And green is like new beginning or growth. And then had all kinds of other colors. And I went and I said, what are you doing getting off your bike? And he goes, he goes, um, this is a steep hill, man. I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to walk up it. And then I walked over and I looked and I said, well, you've got it in too hard of a gear. You can put it in an easy gear and your chain is rusty and needs oil. And then, and he goes, oh, okay. And he was really kind. And he had large beads of sweat dripping off the tip of his nose. And, and so he walks up to the top. I grab my briefcase, close my thing, take about three steps, and I just got blasted. And then I went, oh, my God, that was the Lord. And so I went, I went, sir, stop. And I go running after him. And he's at the top of the hill, stopped stopped at a red light and uh, and and then I started so I started asking him questions because my mind is going nuts and all this stuff was to try to the this is an application to try to help me in my walk of where I am right now because he's trying to show me not to make it by the sweat of my brow I need the oil of the Holy Spirit on my rusty chain and my walk or my bicycle is, you know, it's a little rusty, but I'm supposed to be in rest and not trying to go up the hill in a really strong gear. And then I got there, let's see, what did I, I asked him his name and he said his name was David. And then like King David, and, and uh, he asked me what my name was and I said, Jack, and he said, I love you, Jack. That's a beautiful name. And he really wasn't telling me that's a beautiful name. He was telling me that, you know, 
I'm making Stacy cringe, that I was beautiful. You know, when we pray in the name of Jesus, that's us, you know, just being his representative. And then I asked him where he lived, and he said he lived in the Highlands, which makes sense. And then he told me that he knew an attorney in town named Braswell. And I looked that up. Braswell is, a, is an old English word that means a dweller at a broad well, residence near the village well, a large spring, stream, or river. And then he told me that he was married to a CPA. And I've actually seen the Holy Spirit in one of these types of encounters, and it's a woman. Um, but he said he was married to, like the, like the Holy Spirit is the perfect teacher you know, calculating. And then he, uh, the light, there's something that kind of controls this because, because I just walk into the office and then I'm, I'm pondering it. My brain's going crazy, wondering what just happened. And I walk in there and Wesley just goes, hey, that was the Lord. But uh, that, that in, in doing the preparations for talking about friends and family on Sunday and just, I had been working on that message ever since I heard the Lord speak that to me. These are your friends and family at Moravian Falls back April the 28th. And the Lord, the Lord actually spoke to me in the last 10 days, more than any 10 day period in my whole life. And that, oh, I think that there's a relationship the light should be getting brighter every day in spite of our circumstances. And um, I wanted to talk about the word of God because it's the most important thing in, in our lives. And I've, I have to be fired up and just yearn for more. Um, but I think, but, but I think too, the most important thing, I mean, I feel... I actually feel inadequate. I mean, I'm just being honest. I feel inadequate in the way that I hear God's voice. And um, I mean, he's wired me. He once told me that I was unique among the unique. I mean, that makes me feel pretty cool. Uh, or you could just say that's just weird and peculiar. <laughs> but but um, he makes us all very differently. But I want... I want whatever he has in store for me and I want nothing at all to hold that back. And I love the Lord and there's nothing more important in life than going after that with all of our might. And that includes the Lord and each one of you too. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. You look like you're falling asleep. No. Nope. Is that okay? Anything to add? Pray for you. We need an encounter. Okay. Um, oh my God. Lord God, we just praise you and love you with all of our heart. We just love you so deeply. And Lord God, I wish this last thing that, that I shared with them, um, I pray just a freshness, a new beginning, a radical encounter, you know, make yourself known again and again, more radical to anybody watching and every one of us in this room. We want to know you as deeply as possible. We want to be amongst your greatest of friends and brothers and sisters to you. So I pray that here, Lord God. I ask that. I believe that you said in the word, Lord Jesus, that we pray the Father's will and that he will grant it. So I just ask that radical dreams and vision in the night season. Lord God, make it easy for them. 
and show yourself to them. I ask that you would show yourself to them in the flesh, just like you did with John the Revelator. And I say, in your timing, Lord, but you know I'm impatient, so I ask for you to do it soon. <laughs> and me too, Lord. We love you, and we just thank you for this time with you and your presence. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.